Good evening. Once again, we are so thankful that you are here this evening, and it has uh, truly been just a wonderful week, a wonderful meeting. I, I cannot begin to express to you how much I've enjoyed being here, and how much I appreciate your attendance every night. Um, I, I believe the meeting has been attended well all week, and... Uh, I'm so thankful for that, and more importantly, we give God the glory for allowing us to come together. And uh, so, uh, just looking forward to already, as, as Jeff explained, that uh, I believe he told me 2017, if that's correct. 20, the fall of 2017 is when I'll be back. And uh, what's amazing is we talked about time last night, and that'll be here before you know it, really. And, uh, I, you know, when I scheduled this meeting many years ago, I thought... That's a long ways off, and then here we are at the conclusion of this meeting. But, uh, you know, I'm so thankful for the way you've invited people this week. We, we have had people here uh, throughout the week uh, from the community. You have invited them. You have brought them here. Um, you're the one that, uh, you know, uh, gave them the invitation, and, and I'm thankful for that and uh, really appreciate that. And uh, hopefully we have planted that seed within their heart and then... As we're going to talk about tonight, you can go forth and uh, water that seed, and then God will give it the increase. So thankful for Brother Jeff that you have here. Uh, you have a wonderful gospel preacher. I, I know you realize that, but you really do. I, I appreciate him. I, I appreciate uh, his love for the truth. Uh, he has a wonderful family, and they're doing great things here. And uh, really, I cannot think of anybody... Uh, that, that would do any better of a job than the man you have. And I, I know that you're treating him well, and I know that he in return is doing the same, and uh, we'll be praying for you all. And uh, you're in our prayers, and uh, you know, keep us in, in, in your prayers, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future. But uh, so thankful for this invitation, thankful for John and uh, Van and inviting me, and uh, looking forward to coming back again, as we said, in the, in the future. Psalm 126. So open your Bible to Psalm 126 with me. Psalm 126. I always try on Wednesday evening to present a lesson in a, in a meeting that is on evangelism. Uh, generally speaking, a lot of times on our Wednesday nights as we gather together for the final night of our meeting, a lot of times it is those who are here on a regular basis for Bible study. And uh, tonight we want to talk about evangelism because it is your all and it is my responsibility to be going out into this lost and dying world and evangelizing. Uh, it is expected of us. It is something that God expects us to do. He's commissioned us to do it. And we must be willing to step up to that wonderful work. In Psalm 126 verses 5 and 6, the Bible tells us, Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That is going to be our text this evening that we're going to build this lesson around. Our lesson tonight is one that I have heard uh, many, many years, at least in points. Um, I remember hearing um, when I was at Camden Avenue, Brother Clarence Deloach preached a sermon very similar to the one I'm going to preach to you tonight. And it's one of those sermons that any time I'm, I'm in an audience and, and I hear preaching, I take notes. I, I'm a person, if I'm not taking notes, my mind wanders very easily. And so I have to have a pen and a paper, and i got to be writing. And I heard Brother Clarence preach a lesson very similar to this, and I stole his points. And uh, then it wasn't very long uh, after that, I went and heard, to another meeting, and there was a preacher preaching almost the same sermon. And so... Uh, I've heard it several different times, and of course, as I, as I present it, I'll put my own little spin on it, I'm sure, but uh, I wanted to give him credit because he's where I heard it first, but, but I know it's been preached many, many a times. You know, the, the idea of the Christian life, or our main work of the Christian life, is to be winning souls for Christ. But why have we at times failed at doing that very thing? 
You look around the Lord's church, and if you travel at all and you go from congregation to congregation, oftentimes what you see is that they are dying off. The numbers are becoming fewer and fewer instead of increasing, instead of doing what God wants us to be doing, instead of watching His church grow. And I've oftentimes said, someone says, well, why is that? Well, brother, it's because we're not working. It's as simple as that. The Bible is very plain that if we go out and we plant the seed and we water the seed, that God will give the increase. If we're doing that, if we're doing our part, God's going to do His part. I think, you know, if we say, well, we're doing our part, but the church isn't growing, then we're in a sense almost blaming God. You know, He's going to do His part if we do ours. And we have to make sure that we're going to do that very thing. When you think about the church here at Sandyville, I said yesterday, it's amazing to me that as, as I've been going now for uh, approximately 10 years, you know, I, I said it, it, it's wonderful to see that the church has remained strong. You, you really haven't died off as you see other congregations doing. Uh, you've been able to, um, you know, stay the course and your numbers have remained strong. And, uh, you know, that is obviously a, a, a big reason why is because you understand the importance of evangelism. And so what we're going to say tonight will certainly not be new, but hopefully it will inspire us to go out into this lost and dying world. The first necessity, if we are going to evangelize the way Christ wants us to, and we are going to be soul winners, is that we must go. It's as simple as that. You know, we must not sit back and talk about going. We must go and do it. I have seen where at times uh, congregations will say, well, we are going to come up with this new committee. We're going to come up with this new idea. We're going to come up with this new evangelistic tool. And so they form this evangelistic group. And oftentimes what happens is it gets no further than the group. They get the group together, but then the group really does not go and do what they're wanting to accomplish. I'd like for you to open your Bibles to James chapter 1, verse 22. James chapter 1. Verse 22 with me, please. I love this particular verse. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I love the way James ends that, deceiving yourself. It's very easy to deceive ourselves. It's very easy to say, I'm doing all I can do for the Lord. I'm working as hard as I possibly can for the Lord. And in reality, we can sit back and say, well, no, I'm not. What are we doing? We're deceiving ourselves. James says, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Listen, brethren, I am so glad you're here tonight. I'm so glad that when I said turn to James 1.22, I heard Bible pages turning. And you're listening. And you're attentive. Or at least you're good at pretending if you're not. But just don't hear the word of God. But do the word of God. God wants us to be workers for Him. He wants us to go. When we talk about evangelizing, when we talk about saving those who are lost, we're not just talking about those who have never been baptized. We have a lot of people, a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ who have obeyed the gospel and who have fallen away. They need to be brought back as well. I know that you have gone out and you have spoken to them. I know the elders have gone out and they have spoken to those people. And maybe at times they've said, you know, we don't want to hear what Van and John have to say. We don't want to hear what Jeff has to say. And you can say, well, we have tried to reach out to them and I commend you for doing that. But don't quit. Send them a card. Make a phone call. You don't know when they're going to be going through one of those valleys in life and they need the Lord. And all they want to know is that somebody still cares about them. That phone call or that card might bring them back to the Lord. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus gave what we call the Great Commission. He said, All authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make you disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He gave a commission to those disciples, but that commission certainly still applies to all of us today. Consider these, uh, this idea of going. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, after Isaiah has been cleansed, God tells him, go and tell this people. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said, go into all the world. 
In, Matt, in Luke chapter 14, verse 21, we read, Go out quickly into the streets and the cities and the lanes. Luke 15, 4, Go after that which is lost. Acts 8, 29, Go near and join yourself to this chariot. Acts chapter 10, verse 20, Go with them, doubting nothing. And then I love Acts chapter 9, verse 15, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. That's told to Ananias. You know what I love about that particular situation is, is Ananias is a lot like we are. God says, Ananias, I want you to go at, after Saul of Tarsus. And Ananias, what's he do? He makes an excuse of why he cannot. That's a lot of times what we do, brethren. I am a great excuse maker. I, I can, you know, and even with Ananias, he had a reason. Well, well, Lord, I know of Saul. And he has the authority to arrest people. He's been persecuting the church. I know of him. And the Lord says, you still have to go. He says the same thing to us. We might have all the excuses. We might have all the reasons of why we cannot go, why we are too busy, why we... And God says, go. We must make sure that we're doing our part. If we are doing our part, God will do his. Go over in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 7 with me, please. 2 Kings chapter 7. And I want to look at a story that is told about four leprous men. And these four leprous men, the Bible tells us in, in verse 3, were at the entrance gate and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? Why are they at the entrance gate? Because they're not allowed into the city because they have leprosy. But the whole city is in a famine. They're all starving to death. And so they, they're sitting outside the gate. And they said, why are we sitting here? Let's just go turn ourselves in. Let us go throw ourselves at the mercy of the Syrians. And so the Bible tells us they decide to go over to the army. And they're just going to turn themselves in. And they think maybe they'll make us slaves. But either way, maybe we'll be fed. Maybe, maybe we won't die like the rest of our people are going to. And the Bible says in verse 5, And as they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians, and when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused an army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses and the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel is hired against us, the kings and the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians, to attack us. Notice what happens. These four leprous men, they arrive to the camp and what do they see? They see no army. But they see all kinds of food. They've left everything behind. And so they do what any normal thinking person would do. They gathered for themselves. And they went and they hid some of that. But then I want you to notice verse 9 with me. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. And we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore, come let us go to tell the king's household. They said, wait a minute, what we're doing is not right. We have good news. We have found food. There's an open camp with food. We have to go back and tell the people. We have to go back and tell the king. And we have to go right now. Why? They said, or else we'll be punished. Brethren, there's a lesson for us. We have the best news and we have to go and share it right now. Why? Because if we do not, we'll be punished. God expects us to go out into this world and to tell people about Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and all that God the Father and God the Son have done for us how we have the word of God and it can lead us unto salvation. I told you the other day about good news when you have it. You want to share it? If there was one who was baptized into Christ tonight, and we hope that's the case, if you're not a child of God and you obeyed the gospel and you, you've been thinking about being baptized, maybe you were lying there last night and you thought about being baptized, and tonight you obeyed the gospel and you were baptized into Christ, would you not want to go share that news with everybody? You'd want to go tell everybody. Guess what? The last, you know, we had a baptism last night. We had a baptism tonight. 
We, we have a new brother in Christ. We would share that news. Why? Because it's good news. Let us make sure that we're going to share the best news, the news the world needs to hear, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to go to Acts chapter 8 with me. Acts chapter 8. And I love this particular uh, account that we have here of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Here's a man who is an evangelist. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 8 and verse 26, Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And I want you to notice what it says in verse 27. So he arose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And he was sitting in his chariot and reading Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him. He ran. The Bible says he doesn't just take his time. Philip takes off and he runs after that chariot. He gets to him as soon as he possibly can. And the Bible says that he then began to preach Jesus to him. We must pray that God will give us swift feet to run with the gospel of Christ and share it in this lost and dying world. You know, if he would not have ran to that chariot, he might not have caught the eunuch when he did. He caught the eunuch in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7, as we know it. If he would not have ran, the eunuch might have already been out of Isaiah 53 and already into Isaiah chapter 54. But because he ran to that chariot, he caught him in Isaiah 53, that beautiful prophecy about Jesus Christ and all that he was going to do for each and every one of us. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, well, how can I unless somebody teaches me? He takes him from what he knows and he presents the unknown. And he talks to him about Jesus Christ. And obviously he talks to him about the remission of his sins and baptism. And it's then when they come up to that water that he says, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip replied, nothing if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Philip ran with the gospel of Christ. That's what we need to be doing. I, I've been so happy this week. And really, I cannot overstate just how impressed I've been with the number of visitors we have had from the community here this week. And I know they were here because you were inviting people. And I'm thankful for that. And, you know, we're always telling our members of Bridgeport the same thing. We're having a gospel meeting. Invite someone. But, brethren, invite someone to come this Sunday. Don't wait until your spring gospel meeting. That's a long ways down the road. Invite them to come this Sunday. Brother Jeff will open that Bible and he will preach to them and he will share with him God's Word. We need to be evangelists all the time. Not just when we're having gospel meetings. Not when we're having a friends and family day. Not just when we're having a vacation Bible school. Those are great times and they're great opportunities because you could tell somebody, we're doing this on Monday night or Tuesday night. Come on out. But invite them to come this Lord's Day with you. And if they say no, Invite them the next Lord's Day. And if they say no, give them a week off, but invite them the following Lord's Day. Keep on inviting them. Keep on being evangelists because the real soul winner understands that it's not so much human talent, it's divine compulsion. The real soul winner, soul winner understands it's not a, a matter of methodology, it's motivation. You just have to be motivated. You just have to want to do it. The story is told about an old farmer in Georgia who was drafted into the Confederate Army. And without any training, he was placed into the infantry. And they went out to battle, but old Jim didn't understand all the signals. And all of a sudden, the signal went up to retreat. But Jim didn't know that signal. Everyone retreated but him. That night, they were sitting around the campfire and they thought to themselves, poor old Jim, he just... He just didn't know. But after a while, here came Jim. And he had five Union soldiers. And he said angrily, why did you all leave me? He said, the woods are full of them. <laughs> you know, the world is full of lost and dying souls. And brethren, we cannot retreat. We just have to keep pressing on. And that one soul 
that you lead to Christ, you never know how many other souls are going to be led to Christ by that one person. I thought to myself as I was looking over this lesson, and I, and I thought about just our family in general. And, and I know it goes back further than my grandma Davis, but I, but I think about her and how she was able to lead her family to the gospel. And she was baptized, and uh, her her family was baptized into Christ. Of course, there's a, there's a lot of them here tonight, and Aunt Amy's here, and Candy, and uh, my mother, and uh, I'm probably missing people as I'm looking around here. But then their husbands were baptized into Christ, other than I think Jeff was already a Christian. But my mom converted my dad. Candy converted Terry. Their children were baptized into Christ. On down the line. I was able to become a gospel preacher. I've been able to baptize, I don't know, 60, 70 people into Christ, maybe. I don't know. I really don't keep count. One soul can lead to so many other souls. We never know. There was a man over in the countryside over by our way who we baptized into Christ and he was so on fire for the Lord we baptized him. He said, I'm going to go and I'm going to convert my family. And you know you did one of those things of, okay, go get them, buddy. Yeah, that's right. Seven other souls were baptized into Christ because of that one man. He went back and told them about Jesus Christ. He went back and told them about baptism and it wasn't long that he came back and he said, we need to have some Bible studies. One soul Yes, the angels in heaven rejoice over that one soul, but you never know what that one soul is going to lead others to Christ. Brethren, we need to go, but we also need to glow. We need to glow with compassion, the Bible tells us. And in, in, in the psalm we read, Psalm 126, it says, going with tears and compassion. We need to be a compassionate people. You know, we go out and we see this world at times, and I don't know about you, but there are times that I become very angry and very bitter when I look at this world. I turn on Fox News for five minutes and I'm ready to go. I'm mad as soon as I just start listening to it and I think, well, you know, I, my, my, Megan said to me, don't even watch the news anymore. Don't even read the paper. Don't, if it's going to make you that upset, just don't even watch it. She had a point and I turned it off and got myself under control a little bit. Uh, but you know, Instead of becoming angry, I need to become sad. And I need to take that compassionate heart out into this world and be compassionate with people. Show them I love, love them. Show them that I care. You've heard that before, but people don't, do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. That, that's a true statement. We need to go out into this world and we need to have compassion for those that are lost and dying. Imagine Jesus in Matthew chapter 23 in verse 37. As, as I picture that text, there might have even been tears running down his face. We don't know. But the Bible says that he stood over Jerusalem and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing it, it, it broke our Lord and Savior's heart. He said, I wanted to save you, but you weren't willing to listen to me. You were not willing to follow me. Think about Psalm 23 and the compassionate father. Think about the prodigal son as he returns home and the father runs out to meet him and he kisses him and he hugs him. We need to be a group of compassionate people. That was not a strong point of mine for the longest time. I was not a compassionate person. I was not a compassionate husband. I was not a compassionate father. I was not a compassionate minister. I just wasn't. You can ask Megan, when we first got married, I was anything but compassionate. I remember there'd be times where maybe she'd start to cry, and I'd say, oh, don't, don't cry. And, and, and I'd tell her, I'd say, if you're going to cry, just go in that other room. I, just, I don't even want to see that. That, brother, that's not compassion. That's just being a jerk. Amen to that. I, would, I tell you, I, I'm repenting, I guess, right here. But, you know, I was that way. I, and, and I had to learn what compassion really was. I like to think now that I'm a compassionate person, one who truly uh, you know, longs for and sorrows after those who are lost. 
But I want you to go in your Bible to Mark chapter 20 with me, or Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 34. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. You know what's amazing to me is you read your New Testament, how many times it talks about Jesus and his compassion. Go over to Matthew 15. Just a couple pages in your New Testament. Matthew 15, verse 32. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and he said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat and I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. What caused Jesus to react the way he did? <coughs> compassion. If we have compassion, it proves the love of God is truly in us. 1 John chapter 3, 17 tells us, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Brethren, I understand that there are going to be certain people here that are more compassionate than others. But I know that you can grow in that area. I joke all the time about my father. He's not here to defend his case tonight. But when we grew up, he wasn't a real compassionate man. But as I've watched him grow in the years, and I watch how he is with my baby sister, and I joke with him about it, he's much more compassionate now. He's much more compassionate with his grandchildren. I watch him and, and the things that he laughs about when Carson and Millie Kate do or the way he feels bad for them when he sees one of them fall down or something. You know, for us, it was just stand up. You're fine. Oh, but, you know, he's running with open arms now. He's got my, I mean, he's putting Band-Aids on, whatever. You can become more compassionate if you really want to be. And we need to be as Christians. In Luke 10, 35, we read on the next day while he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and he said to him, take care of him, and whatever you spend when I come again, I will repay you. Talking about the good Samaritan. We need to be good Samaritans. We need to be going out into this world because when people see that you're compassionate, when people see that you care, it's them that they're going to want to hear about Jesus Christ. They're going to want to hear about the gospel. They're going to want to hear about, what do I need to do to be saved? That good Samaritan was a good example, made a good impression on that day. That's what we need to be doing as well if we're going to be evangelists for Christ. Be just like him. Have a compassionate heart. We call Jeremiah the weeping prophet as it said in John, Jeremiah 9.1, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears. Jeremiah was not just a weeping prophet. Jeremiah was a compassionate prophet. Jeremiah loved his people so much. And the, and the thing that kept him preaching, even when he wanted to quit, was that he loved the people and he felt bad for them and he wanted them to repent and he wanted them to turn from their ways, they just would not listen. There's an example of the times we can preach and we can preach and we can preach. Sometimes that person's just going to be hardened to the gospel of Christ. We can't do anything about that. We can pray for them, we can preach, keep preaching to them, but eventually they have to make their own mind up. But we need to have compassionate and loving hearts to those who are lost in this world. So many times I've seen people who have said, oh, don't go speak to so-and-so. Oh, they're a terrible person. They're, you know, they're a scoundrel. They, they don't want to hear the gospel of Christ. They're, they're not going to be baptized. You know, I bet you there's some people here tonight that at one time somebody said, well, that person's not going to be baptized. You know, somebody probably said that about Dorton at one time. Well, that, that scoundrel, he's not, going, he's not going to be a preacher. And now look at it, standing up every Lord's Day, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have compassion for people. Love them, be there for them, and encourage them. But also, not only do we need to go and know, or excuse me, and glow, but we need to know the Word of God. You have to know the Bible. And you have to know what the Bible teaches. And you have to be able to teach that Bible to those who are seeking and searching for the truth. Now there's nothing wrong if you do not know everything to say. That's one of those times where you say this. 
Would you be willing to have a Bible study with our elders or our preacher? You know that they're going to be willing to study with them. You know they're going to be more than happy to show them what the Bible says. You do not have to have all the answers. In fact, if they would start to question you and say, well, why do you do this? Why do you believe this? Instead of giving them the wrong answer, say, are you willing to have a Bible study? They might say yes. They might say no. But either way, you know there's some interest there because they're wanting to talk about the Bible with you. I love nothing more than when somebody oftentimes finds out that I'm a preacher and, and they want to then discuss the Bible. It's amazing to me. I could be sitting, you know, in the uh, shop having my truck worked on and oftentimes I carry a real little New Testament with me and I'll open that Bible and it's amazing how many people will start a conversation up when they see that Bible. I remember the first time I got on an airplane, it just so happened I had my Bible open and I was sitting there and, I, and it was when I was um, flying to, uh, it wasn't my first time, it was, it was when I was in the school of preaching. I was flying down to see Megan, we were dating. And uh, I had my New Testament open and I started to read it as we were about to take off and I had this man sitting beside me. He looked at me and I looked at him. He looked back at me, he looked at my Bible. He said, do you always read that Bible before you fly? I said, well, I said, I read my Bible every day. I said, I'm a preacher. And we began to talk about the gospel. And, and I don't know whatever happened after that conversation. But it's amazing to me just how many people, when they see that Bible in your hands, that they'll want to sit down and talk to you about it. The Bible is a book that people are interested in. Even if they, they do not know the Bible, they want to know the Bible. And it's amazing to me about when you go out into this world... How few of people really know anything about the Bible? Very few people could probably even tell you where Jesus was born. They, uh, you, you certainly know they couldn't tell you about the books of the Bible. They could not even begin to maybe name the New Testament books. They might get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and then they're finished. They're done. We live in a world where people are interested about the Bible, but I think a lot of them are intimidated when it comes to the Bible. They're intimidated because they think, I'm never going to be able to know all of that or uh, come to an understanding. And we have to convince them otherwise. They can know the Bible. They can come to a knowledge of the truth. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures were able to make you wise through salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I love this passage. It teaches us that the Word of God is profitable for doctrine. That is, it's profitable to go out and tell it to people and teach people the Word of God. It's profitable for reproof. That is, it corrects. It corrects false ideas. It corrects false teaching. It corrects a sinful lifestyle. It's profitable, he said, for correction because it sets straight every crooked way. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 tells us, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way which leads to destruction and there are many who go in thereby because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life and few there are who find it. When I read that verse, I realize there's a lot of people who need corrected. I'm supposed to, Lord willing, next year I might be traveling to Africa. And if I go in, in August on, on this mission trip, the one thing about it is they're going to be baptizing souls into Christ. And someone was saying to me recently, they said, why is it that when you see these reports on India and you see the reports on Africa, why are they growing there? And the only thing I could say was this. They're not just saying they're the church. They're being the church. The reason why they're growing, it's not a secret. It's because they're taking the Bible and they're going out and preaching it to people. They're going into these villages and people say, well, they're more receptive over there. Yeah, they're a lot more receptive. They might kill you. They're a whole lot more receptive. Now, I understand that they don't have maybe the worldly things that stand in their way as we do in this country. and It's a different situation. But the gospel is still powerful here as it is over there. Just as powerful. 
It will pierce their soul. It will pierce the soul's ear. We just have to go out and preach it. It takes courage. We have to have that courage. The Bible tells us as well, for it will instruct us in righteousness. It teaches us what is right. It teaches us what is necessary. I love what Psalm 19, verse 9 and verse 11 says, that your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. We have to place that word of God within our heart and take it out into this world. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says this, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and... Or, piercing even the vision of oh soul and spirit I'm messing up brethren go to Hebrews chapter 4 my mind just left me and that happens that happens I, I'm not the Lord <coughs> for the word of God is living a powerful and sharper than a two edged sword piercing in the division of soul and spirit joint and marrow to discern our thought and intents of the heart I was going to say that it didn't sound right <laughs> I love what that said it's living and it's powerful. The Word of God is still alive today. Amen. It's changing lives. It, it's changed lives today. We might not have witnessed it, but there is somebody today who's obeyed the gospel of Christ. It, there might be somebody here tonight that will obey the gospel of Christ. Why? Because the Word of God is still alive. It's still as powerful today as it has ever been. James chapter 1 verse 21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save your souls. Amen. That's what the Word of God will do. It will do it for you tonight. And it will do it to those who are not here tonight if we take the Word of God to them. If you know somebody that you've been working on, I saw you have all kinds of tracks out front. Take them one. <laughs> Take them. You know, I remember they had those CDs out a couple years ago, those DVDs on searching for the truth. Get a couple of those and just hand it to them and say, just watch this. People want to know the truth. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it calls it the sword of the Spirit. Brother, what's a sword do? A sword penetrates. It pierces. That's what the Word of God does. It penetrates or it pierces. As Hebrews 4, 12, uh, 4, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 said, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. The Word of God will pierce the heart of many. The Word of God pierced all of you. It touched your heart enough to cause you to want to obey the gospel of Christ. It's pierced your heart enough to say, okay, I'm going to give my life to Jesus and I'm going to serve Him. If it's worked on you, it will work on others. Amen. We just have to make sure we take it to others. The Word of God is revealing. Brother Clarence said this, and I wrote it down. He said, it's the searchlight, it's the x-ray machine, it's the stethoscope. It explores, discovers, and exposes. I thought that pretty good. In fact, when I wrote that down, I have notes that he from my sermon when, when I heard him preach it. And I went back to him and said, okay, give me all of that again. That's, that's good. I like that. He said, it's the searchlight, the x-ray machine, the stethoscope, and it explores, discovers, and exposes. That's what the Word of God does. It might be doing that to you on this very evening. It might be piercing your heart enough tonight to cause you to obey the gospel of Christ. And I hope that is the case. I hope that if you're here tonight and not a child of God, that you will do that very thing. What we have talked about tonight on evangelism, I can promise you this, it works. It's nothing new. It's not like I came up here and said, I have this great new evangelistic plan for you. I don't. I recently had to go to the school of preaching. They asked me to come up there and preach in a preacher's meeting. And they gave me the topic of church growth. We've been blessed to have growth at Bridgeport. And they wanted me to come and talk about our growth. And Brother Andy said, I want you to come and tell us everything you're doing. And I said, Andy, what do you want me to tell you? I said, we're not doing anything that's new. I said, we're just going out and preaching the gospel to people. And we're knocking on doors and we're inviting people and we're having 
you know, different things. On maybe a Friday or Saturday night, we're, we're inviting our friends and we're inviting our families. And then we just talk about the Bible to them and show them what the Bible says. When I read the New Testament, that's what they were doing. They were taking the gospel and they were proclaiming it everywhere. Did everyone respond favorably to it? No. Did everyone obey the gospel? No. But there were a lot of people who did. In Acts chapter 2, we hear about those 3,000. Do you realize there were thousands upon thousands upon thousands who didn't obey the gospel? That's going to be the case with us. We're going to have a lot more people tell us no than tell us yes. But that cannot stop us. In Luke chapter 8, Verses 4 through 15. We're almost finished here. You read about the parable of the sower. I love the parable of the sower. In fact, a lot of times I turn that around. A lot of times we take this and we say to ourselves, what kind of, what kind of soil are we looking at here? Are, are we looking, you know, at the rocky soil, the thorny soil? Is it the good soil? And we say, we want to go out and find that good soil. A lot of times I turn it around and I, instead I say this, what kind of soil are we? Am I the good soil? If I'm the good soil, then I'm going to go out and proclaim the word of God. But yet at the same time, the one thing I've learned about reading the parable of the sower and life in general, we have a lot of people here who are farmers tonight. You know the one thing about sowing seed? You better till that ground up real good first if you want it to take. I think that's true with the gospel. We can go out and sow the seed, but let's make sure we till that ground up, till that heart real good so that seed really takes. You might do that a number of ways. You're probably going to be tilling that ground up or tilling that heart up when they just watch you on an everyday basis. They watch the way you live. Your neighbors see the way you live. Your neighbors see when you go and get in that car on Sunday morning and you drive off. They see when you come back and you're driving off again on Sunday evening. And when you're going in on Wednesday evening, they see those things. They, they know when you go out and you do a good deed for them, just for whatever reason. It wasn't very long ago that we had some big floods come through Bridgeport. And our whole backyard and everything was just a mess and our neighbor's yard was a mess, and I went and I grabbed Carson. I said, Carson, come on. We're going outside and we're working on the neighbor's yard. He said, well, why are we going to do that, Dad? And I said, because it's the right thing to do. And I said, so I'm going to work in our yard, but you're going to go over in their yard. And I want you to pick up every stick and every log you see over there, and you carry them over to our yard, and then we'll take them and we'll get rid of them. And he went over there, and he worked, and he worked, he never complained. I'm thankful he's only six. He's not at that stage yet. And a couple of days later, we had a knock on the door. It was our neighbor. Just wanted to tell us thank you. All of you have done things like that for your neighbors. When you do that, you're tilling that ground to where they can be receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember that there will be disappointments along the way, but that's, that's not up to us. God will be the one who keeps track of all of that. The only thing he asks you to do is go preach. But one more passage and then the lesson George tonight. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Verse 39. Now when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. You know, the Bible tells us that the eunuch went on his way rejoicing, but guess who else was rejoicing on that day? Philip was as well. Give us a watchword for the hour, a thrilling word, a word of power, a battle cry, a flaming breath, a call to conquest or to death, a world to rouse the church from rest to heed the master's high behest. The call is given, ye host arise. The watchword is evangelize. To fallen men, a dying race, make known the gift of gospel grace. The world that now in darkness lies, O church of Christ, evangelize. 
We have to want to be soul winners and go out into this world and tell other people about Jesus Christ. We hope tonight that if you are here not a child of God, then maybe something has been said that has got you thinking about your soul. Maybe you thought to yourself, you know, tonight I need to be baptized into Christ. I need to repent of my sin to confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God before men and have my sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. I said the other day on Sunday morning, oftentimes we we wonder what's holding this person back or what's holding that person back. What, what could be said that could convince them otherwise? What verse could, could you read that could push them over the top? The other thing that's holding them back <coughs> is themselves. Then I we hope that you would give serious consideration about your soul and really think about that and, and just take that first step down. The hardest step you have to take, I've always said this, is that step out into the honor. Once you get out there, Brother Jeff will meet you halfway. He'll come and get you. He'll help you walk down that aisle. I think oftentimes that's what scares people. They think, I just, I just can't, can't do it in front of all those people. Well, first of all, if you can't, then just wait until they leave and we'll baptize you a little bit later. But all you have to do is take that first step down the aisle. And we'll help you the rest of the life. And if you're here tonight and you need to do that, we hope you will. If you're here and you're struggling in your Christian walk and you need the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ, you have sin in your life you need to repent of, then why not do it tonight? Don't leave this building if your soul's not right with God. Leave here tonight as a unit here, rejoicing. Lay your head on your pillow tonight and say, I'm a faithful child.